Good morning, everyone. Thank, thanks for coming. Um, so people have been asking for this tech talk uh, long before Nicholas even joined the company. Um, so here it is. Uh, this talk will be on Google Video, so try not to reveal any confidential information in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, else good. <laughs> hey, is, can you all hear me? OK. Um, yeah, so I basically got pressured into doing this by some of the teams. I don't normally talk to people in public or about anything I do, but it seemed a lot of this stuff seemed relevant to Google, so I thought it'd be worthwhile and interesting to people in the world at large. Um, to start off with, I just wanted to give sort of the, the basics of Quicksilver, sort of introduce it to people who haven't used it before. Um, it's kind of unapproachable because the interface is basically nothing. It just tells you to search, and there's no, almost no indication of what else you could do. Um, at a basic level, which most people use it for, is a launcher. So I can type things like iTunes. And I can jump back and forth between my apps pretty easily. Um, that's something that almost everybody got a grasp of. Additionally, it is sort of like a, it's a mixture of the command line and the finder and lets you get at information you normally wouldn't be able to see. So um, if you, well, if you go to the applications folder, you can use it sort of as a navigational tool. So you can navigate into things. Um, you could actually navigate further down in them to sort of look and see what's inside of it. So I go in my address book and I can see of contacts there. Um, if I chose to, I could go to uh, iTunes and navigate into that and sort of see the content that iTunes has, um, sort of sorted by the things you'd expect to see in iTunes itself. Um, this sort of acts sort of like a file browser, like the Finder, but sort of without having to force you into the Finder or into iTunes as you choose to do it. Um, additionally, there's this sort of extra field. So when I'm in iTunes, if I pick a an album, for example. I can choose to play it. Um, I don't actually know. Uh, you can do the audio from the thing. No. Um, I can choose to play albums. Um, I will show you that it's playing. Um, it'll start playing in the background. And that's sort of the basic thing that you'd expect to do when you had a song. The, the right hand half of Quicksilver really is based on what are the other things you could do with this item. So I found this album. Um, I can choose to play it in the party shuffle, or I could choose to play it next. So rather than remove the track that I'm currently playing, I could say, instead, I want you to put this afterwards and sort of cue these things up and eventually just build a, a playlist without having to interrupt people. Um, so these two things basically make up all of what Quicksilver can do. Um, you find something you want, and you choose what you want to do with it. Um, additionally, the third one that you might see sometimes, like if I choose to mail something to somebody, I can choose the people I want to mail it to. Um, and really, this is sort of building a grammar-like structure, where we have a noun, we have a verb, and potentially an indirect object for that verb. Um, and with these sort of basic building blocks, you can do almost anything and can chain things together. Um, so, oops. So these are the basic sort of things you'll see Quicksilver do. Um, the first one is sort of search, just sort of finding stuff across your computer, sort of what items match this. But the more powerful aspect of it is summoning something, which is a little bit like search, but more, I know exactly what I'm looking for, give it to me now. Um, when I say iTunes, I'm speaking about a specific object. I'm not looking for iTunes in the content of some file. And in, in this case, just simply getting me to that object as fast as possible is the goal. Um, Sometimes you don't know about the, where the object itself is, but you know how it sits in relation to other objects. Um, in the iTunes case, you know where your tracks are based on what albums they're in or what genre they're in. And you will jump to an album, you'll jump to a genre, and then you can use browsing to sort of pivot down to find the item you want. Um, this works especially well in cases of people, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, the last thing is acting, which isn't really sort of a way of navigating, but in acting upon something, you can cause new things to be created. So if I take a file and I compress it, I create a new object and basically navigate from the original object to this compressed version of it. And using these sort of four things, you can get around and do almost anything you would try to do in an application, but faster. So to start off with, I wanted to talk a little bit about the philosophy behind Quicksilver. This isn't really stuff that's actually implemented, but more the general guidelines that I followed or thought of as I was going along. Um, these three 
basic, make up the basics of it. Um, for sort of fast universal access is probably the thing that most people see. And it's, more, it's mostly about finding anything on your computer or on the web um, just sort of instantly. It's, the major point is to be able to search anything, not just files or not just web pages. And uh, Google and Spotlight are very good at spot, are searching those specific things, but not across both. Additionally, people are also really important, and being able to search for people and use them as sort of ways of finding things is important. Um, it's, uh, uh, additionally, the, the place these things live shouldn't matter. My data lives in the cloud, it also lives on my computer, and being able to search across the web and across the content in my computer makes it more valuable. Um, Google Desktop sort of moving towards this by letting you look at your Gmail and also look at your files. But really, these things have to be added on like a case-by-case -case basis. It's really hard to sort of let you search across multiple things. Um, Quicksilver makes a point of indexing a variety of web services, usually ones that are focused on content. So things like Backpack or Stick It, where people will store to-do information or just contact information that they want to look up. And even at the sort of basic level, being able to say, I want to search for this, this page I know of that is my content and just jump to it, makes them a lot more usable. Um, the second part of sort of ignoring boundaries between things is ignoring the boundaries of the file system. We talked a little bit about iTunes as sort of a container for stuff. Um, if you actually look at iTunes in the file system, it's full of garbage. Like the, the application package itself isn't really meaningful. And in the finder, you wouldn't even be able to get to, into this. But it would be interesting if we could see what happens when you sort of drilled further down into things. Quicksilver sort of abst or abstracts the file system out and says, instead of showing you what the real contents are, I'm going to show you what I believe the content should be. And it's done on a case-by-case -case basis for apps. So Safari shows you bookmarks, iTunes shows you music, iPhoto shows you albums. Um, almost all media apps are sort of filled with content. And representing them as their content and not just sort of a dead end is the best. Um, if you walked, watched uh, Aza Raskin's talk about a way with applications, you're going to recognize a lot of stuff because our goals are pretty consistent with each other. Um, if you look at a lot of tools nowadays, they're all focused on going places. So Spotlight, Google Desktop, Google.com, they're really about finding something and getting there. And getting there is, is half the battle. And it's a huge help to be able to sort of find this thing instantly and not have to worry about where did I put it. But once you get there, you still have to fight with the UI of whatever app you're going into. And you end up taking all these steps to actually accomplish what you want after having found the thing you're looking for. And what might be more ideal is to simply do the thing you were trying to do initially without actually having to go. Um, in cases of Photoshop and things that are more complicated, it makes sense to go into an application and sort of work in it for a little while. But if I'm simply trying to jot off an email or um, sort of add something to my to-do list, I shouldn't have to interrupt what I'm doing. Um, if you look a little bit, there's a lot of tools that work on sort of making it easier to do things that you do frequently. So something like Automator lets you build up chains of actions to specify, oh, I'm going to compress this file, upload it to my web server, and then send it to my friend. And if you do that often, it's sort of worthwhile. Um, Pipes, as well, lets you mishmash data and into a form that you can sort of look at it. But all these require upfront effort. And you basically have to do planning to sort of say, I'm going to do this frequently, make this easier. Some of the more on-the-fly ones are things like the services menu, which is probably a bad example because it's so hard to use. Um, Apple put this in to basically let you uh, manipulate any content that you have. So. So I can use the yeah, services menu, stop that. basically look, look up in dictionary. And it takes the context into account, takes me into dictionary, and, and executes that service. One of the first things I did in Quicksilver was take that whole body of information and include it. So this, that same action appears here, and I can use it as sort of a starting point to add functionality. Um, eventually, I had to sort of dig deeper to sort of add more data. but. At a basic level, the OS provides these things already. Um, some other stuff that takes context into account is the Enzo launcher for Windows. It's actually quite good at looking at what you're currently doing and taking that into account. Rather than, saying, rather than having to explicitly ask it to define a given word, you can just simply say define. And it says, what are you trying to define? Oh, this is the selection. I'm going to define this for you. And if you wanted to, you could override it and write something else. But Taking the, taking the current context into account makes these things much more flexible. Um, 
in addition to taking the context into account, it's also nice to not have to worry about, not worry, or it's nice to not have to leave the context to accomplish something. So say I'm giving this presentation to you and I realize that I have to get milk or something. And I'm gonna add this to my to-do list, which is sort of a simple thing that a lot of people do with Quicksilver. Um, that'll simply add the text in. Um, if I wanted to, I could go to it, and I don't actually know what's in this file because I've been doing it all day. So it adds get milk. Um, but the idea is that I don't actually have to leave the presentation. I don't actually have to leave the presentation to do this. I can do it in context. I don't have to worry about it. And if I wanted to email that to somebody, I could do that and just stay here, and I'm done. And it'll go off eventually. Um, the last thing is. This act without effort, or act without doing, is based on a Taoist philosophy, and it, I sort of wanted to take the opportunity to babble on about it for a bit, just because it was such a guiding principle in the way the app was built. Um, Wei Wu Wei basically translate as act, translates as act without doing. Um, Wu Wei is non-action. And the idea is not, you don't actually do these things, but rather you work with the natural flow of things so that it is an effortless form of action. Um, you're sort of in harmony with the way the system works, and in the end, you don't leave a trace. And basically, things will, you can resolve things and get back to what you're doing without having to do any interruption. Um, now, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about implementation. So that was sort of the overall goals. This is more what, what and how these things were actually done. Um, going back to sort of these high-level goals, um, each one of them sort of dictated how the system was built. Um, as far as how fast you can go, um, really the, the limit on search is eventually not going to be optimization. It's more the user input. So Quicksilver is to the point, it's not actually searching a lot, which makes it faster, but it's at the point where the user input is the thing that's slowing it down the most. I can't give you the application you want because you haven't typed enough letters for me to understand what it is. Um, and the only real way to optimize this is to decrease input or eventually just read the user's mind. And there's not really a clear way to do this. It's simply a matter of allowing them to feel comfortable with what they're typing and understand that that's going to take them to the right place. If they have to worry about, is this the right thing, it's going to slow them down. Um, this is originally, or most of this sort of benefit comes from abbreviation matching, at least in Quicksilver. And this is based on something that LaunchBar did a while back. But not requiring people to type the full uh, either spaces or even prefix matching slows it down. So, so I can type APHO and I'll get Adobe Photoshop even though those letters are spread about different words. And ranking these, thing, ranking these things correctly um, is sort of a fuzzy affair that I don't really understand how it actually works. It's all been tweaked. And basically, we'll learn from the user over time. But every time I type APHO, I'm going to get Photoshop. And if I, if I ever change my idea of what that abbreviation means, I can choose a different one, and the system will learn it. Um, it the whole point is for it to be flexible enough that it doesn't get too stuck in what it's been doing before, but still will learn new things. Um, the second thing is being able to er, er, the second thing is universal access. So how much stuff can you get at? And Quicksilver really has to get into a tons of applications that are spread around your hard drive, including things that are even on the web. And it, it needs to basically get at the data as well as the functionality of them. So eventually, it, it's been growing for a long time, sort of what are, what is, the, what is the content of this app? How can I add it to Quicksilver? What's actually useful to search? And almost anything is valuable, be able, is valuable to be able to search. Um, things like airport networks and network locations, I sort of added on a whim because I thought it would be nice to be able to just type it in. And it's not something you would traditionally search for, but having it mixed into this catalog is valuable. Um, additionally, once you start to get into these things to get their data, you can also learn how to control them and directly manipulate the data rather than simply getting at it. And, piping the data back and forth between different apps. So the initial versions of Quicksilver were all building this in, and it basically started to get really, really big very quickly, because every new app involved a ton more code and understanding all this, these different interfaces. And it was all done with sort of shell scripts or Apple scripts, and each one of them, those scripts had to be dumped in. Eventually, I realized that we had to move to a plug-in architecture, and that's the sort of way it is now, where each of these things deals with a specific app, um, they can provide sort of the basic objects within that app, but also the actions the app provides. And I learned later that people don't deal very well with plugins and having to worry about um, install them and figuring out which ones they have. But as an architecture, it works very nicely. 
Um, and really, each of these plugins just provides these different objects and builds this huge searchable index of items. And the, the index doesn't know what these items are. Um, it just knows that they are things, they have certain types. And the, the plugins themselves provide actions that will look at these items and say, oh, I can handle a URL and I can email it to somebody else. And in effect, create new objects by applying actions to them. One other nice thing about the way the system was built is that the actions themselves are objects that are in this database. That it, it treats nouns and verbs sort of the same way. So I can add shell scripts and I can add other things to make the system more powerful. It, um, it, it, it allows people to sort of collaborate together. So a lot of the, the activity on forums was based around how can I sort of mix and match these things or add additional functionality. Um, okay. So the last thing that isn't, that's part of the implementation that doesn't, it, it sort of helped and it's sort of a strange thing is that the idea of magic and mystery. And I read a blog post by Mike Kuniawski um, that's sort of about magic and user interfaces. And eventually technology is going to be so advanced that it doesn't really help people to understand how it works. And simply being surprised and delighted when it always provides the right answer is the, the, like the correct approach. And a lot of Quixel was based on the idea of just sort of make it seem like it just works and even, main, even forcing this air of mystery when it wasn't worthwhile. Like it, it probably would have been bad for a commercial app to have a web page that was quite so plain and unapproachable, but I liked it because it sort of added to this feeling. And it, the, the alchemy theme was sort of designed around getting people to think of this as a mysterious thing that they could learn and would have to play with, but it might not be reliable, but it might be kind of interesting. I don't know. It, it's, it's an inter interesting way to go, and I probably couldn't have pulled it off if I was trying to sell it. So as far as magic uh, goes, these two um, apps, Abracadabra and Constellation, are extensions to Quicksilver that I did um, with help from other students at CMU when I was there last year. And I wanted to show them off just because they're fun to show off because the, the regular interface is not particularly interesting. Anyway, so um, Abracadabra basically is a simple gesture system. Um, let me get rid of these things. Um, it, it's not particularly intelligent. It watches what you draw and will try to match it to some pre-programmed pattern. Um, I, I'm using it right now to switch back and forth from the Finder and then back into Keynote. Um, but additionally, um, it was built sort of to work with Constellation. They are both focused on mouse-based interaction, which Quicksilver was sort of ignoring. And I really like the idea of being able to browse the stuff in Quicksilver. So Constellation was more about how can I show the actual things and let people sort of navigate through them and find things visually and then decide what they want. And this has all the same functionality that Quicksilver does, where it exposes the action, it exposes the hierarchy. It's just you don't have to know what you're looking for ahead of time. You can just sort of explore it. Um. Sorry. I was in such a rush to get this stuff out of the way. Okay. So Constellation and Abracadabra were sort of ways that I was able to play with the Quicksilver system. And one I want to talk about a little bit was what other things am I trying to do now? Um, in building those two, in building Constellation, I had to build it into Quicksilver because all these plugins and stuff are bound into the application. And there's no way to actually get at that functionality outside, which is a bit of a pain because Constellation is not really that associated with Quicksilver. The two entirely different apps, and forcing them together was just a requirement of doing it quickly. One of the things I'm interested in doing is building a new framework called Alchemy that Quicksilver is basically going to sit upon, and it will allow it to have access to all these plugins, but still allow other applications to coexist with it, where these plugins simply abstract data and the things you can do with data in a way that other apps can load them. And it will take advantage of the things that already exist. So building conduits to Automator and the things it does, and building conduits to Spotlight and the data it has access to. And it's more about sort of glomming things together in a consistent way that one interface or multiple interfaces can access. Quicksilver itself sort of 
been back burner just because I'm more interested in working on this underlying framework and seeing what new things will come of it and then applying them back to the original. Um, even so, there's some stuff that I'm sort of interested in pursuing with Quicksilver. Um, stuff like hybrid search. Quicksilver is really bad at searching content, or rather it doesn't do it at all. It, you can do it with Spotlight, but it's a hack. Um, and one of the things I was interested in doing is saying, what happens if I just search everything at once and get all the results back, and I will show you the ones that I think are the most likely hits, ignoring where they're actually coming from. So they can come from Google.com, they can come from Spotlight, they can come from GD. It just pulls them together. Um, the other thing is contextual search. When I'm in an application, there's probably different things that I'm interested in searching that aren't in sort of the global index. Um, when I'm programming, I might be interested in all the source code files that are currently open and being able to search the methods of them. Whereas normally that would be clutter in the index if I was trying to find those. Um, additionally, sort of letting people do search for actions. Right now you can't search for actions. You have to find a noun and then you can act on it. But what if you could just find an action and then Specify a noun if you want. If not, just take the current context as representing the current noun. So I would be able to do stuff like define. And it would just say, oh, define what? Not that. Um, yeah. So the last question is sort of what, how does this apply to Google? What things could Google do and what things are Google, what, what things are Google doing already um, to sort of accomplish this? The main thing that Google has an advantage of is the interconnectedness of its apps. Um, it, it's, it's already starting to connect its apps together. You can see this in Reader, where it's able to do things like email directly f into Gmail from Reader, as well as sort of share things. And there, there are a few other places you'll see this. Um, but each time we do this, it's very hard coded. It's like it's, a, it's an implementation in, these, in, in that app. And what would be more interesting to say is, what if I don't use Gmail? What if I use Apple Mail? And I want my web apps to be able to communicate back to that. And they don't really care anymore what they're emailing it. They're just knowing that this is a, a conduit with which I can send stuff. And part of this is making the data that the apps contain available to other apps. And microformats can do this to some extent. Um, but Google has an interesting opportunity because they have control of such a large suite of apps already that they could build a system that would be extensible around this. Um, one other thing that Google can look at is the number of search boxes that are on my machine. Um, all of these search different stuff, um, but some of them have similar behavior. Spotlight and the Google search box and the browsers basically are both universal searches. They're all about find me something that matches this. Um, and they could be easily, be easily be unified into one type of search box. Um, there's also contextual search boxes in each application, which are, are limited to the content of that application and really do warrant standing alone as something else that you can look at. But they could be tied into the universal search. Um, the third kind, and these, these are a bit of an exception, where they are simple filter boxes within the, OI, within the UI, but they can be much more tailored towards a specific type of search or activity. Um, this, uh, let's skip over a slide. This quick context picker in Gmail is nice because it basically lets you search, con search context, but it also lets you act on them. And its, it's results are very tailored to this, and the actions that it shows are very tailored to this, but it allows a huge amount of functionality in a very, very small space. Um, other search boxes that Google's sort of doing nice things with is the Docs one, which has some amount of, the, basically the summon ability, where you can go to a search box, you can type some string, and jump directly to the thing you're thinking about. C potentially with Docs, you are, you, you know roughly what the name of the thing is. You're not trying to do sort of a complex, deep search on it. You just want to jump to it. And this ability to jump to things is something that could be carried across in the universal search or in the individual app search boxes. All right, I think we're done. Thank you.